The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Securing the Things, Including the Ones You Already Have. My name is Jason Keeler, and I'll be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Tom Burns, CEO and founder of ThreatStop, and Johannes Ulrich, Dean of Research and faculty member of the SANS Technology Institute. Before I turn things over to Tom and Johannes, the Q&A portion will take place at the end of the webcast. However, please feel free to submit your questions at any point by using the chat window. Right now, I'd like to introduce our featured speakers, Johannes Ulrich and Tom Burns. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thanks very much for taking time out of your day to attend. Um, Johannes and I have been working on these uh, particular issues for quite some time, and uh, now that they've come to the forefront, I think it's a good idea that we have this conversation and get the word out there to people. Um, Johannes and I have been collaborating through the Internet Storm Center for most of the last 15 years, and uh, ThreatStop came out of making the Storm Center actionable. Um, it was uh, as a result of that collaboration, in fact, that uh, the whole company was founded. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I, I am the founder of ThreatStop. I came up with the original idea of how we would use DNS to make, uh, to, to make the D-Shield list actionable across multiple different types of firewalls because I've been trying to manage firewalls for a whole bunch of different charities mostly because they get whatever they get and the D-Shield block list which is produced by the Internet Storm Center had been shown in 2005 by VeriSign to be effective at reducing uh, fraud on websites. In fact, VeriSign's study showed that at least in 2005, if you'd been running the DSHO block list on your firewalls, you'd probably have seen about a 50% reduction in the fraud rate, credit card fraud rate. That was because they figured out that after analysis of future found uh, fraudulent credit card transactions, 50% of the IP addresses from which those credit card transactions had come were actually on the DSHO block lists at the time that the, the credit card transaction happened. So given that I was running these, these firewalls for these various different charities, most notably one that was providing the tax returns for all the charitable foundations in the United States and was therefore constantly under attack because it had the social security numbers and signatures, or at least so the attackers thought, of most of these rich individuals who ran these foundations. Um, I was putting it on these firewalls and it was quite difficult because every different firewall that you got from whoever donated it was, uh, was not necessarily the easiest thing to write a script for. And uh, so that was important to do. And the reason that that was important was thanks to the hard work that Johannes and the handlers at the Internet Storm Center had done in building the D-Shield list and, and uh, curating it. Um, Johannes, could you tell the, the, the attendees a bit more about yourself and how you came up with the ideas for D-Shield and the Storm Center, the background of it? Yeah, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm the Dean of Research of 40 Cents Technology Institute and uh, back in the day, well, the way I sort of came up with the Shield was uh, starting sort of to set up firewalls myself. I ran into the problem where I saw all of these attacks but didn't really sort of know what's normal, what are the attacks I should be expecting sort of just as part of the internet sort of background radiation uh, that, uh, that is sort of happening just by being connected to the internet. So what I did is uh, with the Shield, we started that uh, sort of in late November of 2000 that uh, I collected initially just from friends but then really from the public firewall logs. Uh, so we had scripts and we still have them that collect these firewall logs, we throw them all into a central database and uh, now we can look for basically how many targets are being attacked by a certain source. You can also look at trends, like which ports are being attacked. And that's sort of what the shield part is. Later it became part of the Internet Storm Center as I sort of joined SANS. And with that we got these handlers and then also people just reporting via email what they're seeing in their networks. And that's what we sort of turned it into the data the blog posts or diaries, as we call them, uh, that you find today on the Internet Storm Center. 
And it, it was because of my background in the Army that I met Johannes and was aware of the Storm Center. Um, I'd been doing tactical networking. I was an IP uh, telephony and, and other kinds of building networks guys. Um, ran into a guy named Mark Sox, who was then Captain Promotable Sox, while we were doing Digitizing the Dirt. And as it turned out, we realized that because we're soldiers, we had to operate securely in what was fundamentally an insecure environment. We had to go throw our networks in and use whatever was available to us. And as a result, we became interested in information security. So when Mark left the White House, where he'd been the first presidential advisor for cybersecurity working under Dick Clark, he got involved with SANS and introduced me to Johannes, and that was the beginning of the collaboration. And I was one of those people submitting firewall logs to allow Johannes to do the, the work from my home firewalls and things like that. And it became obvious and especially if you go read Johannes' paper on how the Storm Center worked, that this was doing for things, we didn't think about it as things at the time, but firewalls, the same thing that the backlink way of figuring out what a web, a web server did was for web pages. I mean, Google's big insight was that it didn't matter what your website said about you, because your website was going to say whatever you wanted it, people to hear. It mattered what other people's websites said about you. And the way they said that was by backlinks. So if a site that talked about uh, you know, Yahoo Finance linked to you and you were talking about, say, I don't know, uh, Cisco stock, there's a good chance that you actually had something reasonable to say. If it was a pump and dump site that was linking to you or that you were a pump and dump site, nobody would link to you. And so you wouldn't be so highly rated. Well, the same thing happens with firewalls except in a negative way. The way that this the D-Shield works, it gathers all this data from all these different firewalls, and it looks at how many people say, hey, I didn't want to talk to that guy. Now, it turns out that home firewalls are particularly useful for this, particularly for inbound attacks, because they typically don't have any ports open. So if you're trying to connect to a mail port on a home firewall, there's a really good chance you're a spammer out there trolling for open, open SMTP relays. The same is also true if you have any kind of outbound filtering on the firewall, so a web application firewall inbound or a URL filter outbound, antivirus scanning, those processes now also run on firewalls, and their hits wind up in the logs. So now cross-correlating what a bunch of user firewalls say about a given IP out on the internet across a very large number of sites can be very, very useful in building block lists that show what you want to block right now. So the insight that Johannes and now several others across the internet have built on had led to the creation of some very effective block lists, but there was a big gap. It was really hard to get these block lists into your firewalls in a timely manner. That was difficult, it's still a little bit more difficult than it should be, but it was very difficult until the insight that you could actually use a DNS lookup instead of just manually configuring lists and updating ACLs and still use that as the target of a rule. And that's what was the basis of threats to them. And so we became a way to make this threat data, starting off at the Storm Center, actionable. And we continued the feedback loop of taking in log data that Johannes had built all of DShield along. And we actually share our data with DShield so that we can expand the community. And now we work together as a team to defend each other and the internet. So how do we get here? Oops. Sorry. Um, you know, we're in a we're in an interesting situation right now. Everybody knows it's a daily thing on on the news that there's an attack. There's a whole new thing about point of sales again uh, this morning. We've that's overlapping on top of what's going on with aircraft. How do we wind up here? You know, we had this beautiful network. Everybody built it. It was designed for academic research and sharing of information. And the experiments were partly to d deliver and figure out resilient protocols. And so that was all hacking, really. I mean, that's what hacking really is. In the traditional sense, it's experimentation, figuring stuff out. But as happened with the Morris worm, sometimes you have unintended consequences. And so, wait, experimentation went horribly wrong. And so in the mid-'80s, people started saying, hey, wait a minute, this is, these are things we start to rely on now. You can't just access somebody else's machine and do what you want with it. And so they passed the, uh, the Act in 1986 saying that unauthorized access was, in fact, a crime. But the, the genie was out of the bottle, right? So the idea was, hey, wait a minute, now criminals have started to, start to take notice. People, geeks, people still experimenting. We all decided we were still trying to figure this stuff out. As it turned out, this was a very open source environment, and so we 
wound up building a whole bunch of open source tools that could be used for good things, testing your network, but they also wound up becoming the object-oriented tools that could be used in crime. We didn't realize this. We built stuff. A few people who wanted to get attention for themselves, similar to your graffiti artists, decided to use these to go ahead and say, look at me, look at me, I love you. Melissa, please pay attention to me. And you have your usual situation where you have some, shall we say, shady business people who figured that it was a cheaper way than having a bunch of boiler rooms calling up and trying to bilk grandma out of her retirement funds to send spam all over the place. Now, those are still fundamentally annoyances in that they're relatively easy to deal with and they are fairly low yield, right? As far as crimes go, you're not dealing with things that, although they're, they, they're a pain and we have to build a bunch of tools to block them, um, you're not dealing with things that are going after your real crown jewels. So graffiti is, is nasty. If someone etches up your bathroom, it's pay, as expensive to fix it. Uh, it's really annoying if your phone lines are jammed with someone trying to call in and sell you junk bonds. But it's not someone stealing money out of your cash register, wastage in your inventory, or uh, your biggest competitor having access to your product information before you can release the product. But because all of this was successful, real criminals did take notice. Now we have another different uh, seminar we do from time to time, and, and uh, Johannes has also blogged about it, about how there's now a whole ecosystem around this. But it has really become a complete business. And, of course, governments don't like competition. They like to have all the money and all the power. And so they have taken advantage of the situation. They're like, hey, wait a minute. We have all these tools that we can use. And so now what we have is organized crime and nation state actors taking advantage of all the same vulnerabilities and tools that were used for experimentation and maybe a little bit of stupid behavior. And we have a real problem. They're going after the crown jewels. But wait, there's more. It's not like we have stood still in using the internet and the network tools for good things, for, 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 for bad things. Um, we have more and more and more things connected to the internet. We'll go into a list of some of them later, but it's no longer just your PC or even your phone, um, and it's no longer something that requires you to directly interact with it. Point-of-sale systems are sort of a border, borderline case, right? People don't really think of a, port, a point of sale system as a PC. The vast majority of them are running XP, which we all know is EOL. So we're in a really difficult situation. We've got ever more committed and well-funded actors coming after us, and we're ever more dependent on what's going on. Now, you know, in the beginning, we had a very simple network. You had your internet connection, you had a firewall behind it, traffic went through it. If someone tried to come in, it was blocked at the firewall. In most cases, most people weren't running large amounts of their own servers. And we had log parsers and simple ways of looking at the network and say, oh, here's what's going on. Well, criminals weren't stupid. They decided that there was a whole world of unprotected network systems out there, cable modems mostly, they could take them over and come in, so at least they wouldn't be detected. And if they didn't have an exploit or the port wasn't open, they'd still be blocked. Then they realized, wait a minute, it's free for them to get as many different things as they want to try to attack you in many different ways. Maybe your firewall now becomes an actual firewall. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to get multiple more firewalls. This is about where I started getting involved in this. Was uh, I was working actually involved in load balancers and traffic management. But they have unlimited money. So you're already spending more money. For them, it's effectively unlimited money because they don't pay for any of these systems that are attacking your systems. So what do we have to do now? We have to add specific firewalls for specific types of protocols. We have to add more and more of them. We have unlimited expense effectively while they have the ability to grow without spending any money. Oh, and now that wonderful IDS system with all those logs you're getting is overloaded. And case in point is Target. They had all of this. They had FireEye. But because they were getting so many alerts, they just turned it off because you're inundated with so much useless information you can't do anything with. And that's what we've, we're in the situation we're in now. You've got a situation where the defenders have to buy more and more resources for themselves. The attackers have effectively unlimited resources by taking over devices and people's machines out in the internet. 
and it doesn't cost them much of anything. And it's only getting worse. People think of the Internet as things as, you know, your thermostat, your fire alarm, that little web camera you've got sitting at home. Um, you've got, you know, the Siemens controllers. These are all the things people talk about. Oh, yeah, these are the things. Well, they shouldn't really be connected to a, uh, the, the Internet. Well, isn't the whole point of Nest and your home camera that they are? And whether you like it or not, industrial control systems, which weren't meant to be connected to the Internet because they're used remotely, and the internet is an effective and inexpensive uh, way of connecting systems are. Now, they technically are connected via VPNs, but that just means that the VPN device can be compromised. But what's even worse? Well, you've got other things in your network, right? I mean, people say Internet of Things, right? It really is just another acronym. Everybody's got a printer, right? And we don't connect printers to PCs to share them anymore. It's not like back in the network days where you had to run uh, Novell and plug a printer into your server and then the printer was served off the server queues. Those things all have Wi-Fi, in many cases walk-up Wi-Fi. They've got firmware that can be flashed. And how often do you patch your printers? Well, apparently not often enough because here's a guy who actually figured out how to flash a standard Canon printer so you could play Doom on it. I mean, let's face it, we all want to run around and, and kill the zombies in our network. What more fun way to do it than on somebody else's printer? This thing has a remotely exploitable download capability in the web interface that uh, you can basically use to remotely flash the firmware. And so he did. Uh, this is running a lot slower than it should be. Now, the long, the short, and the tall of that is it's, it's, we do this in the, in the live session where we present at Lunch and Learn. But it's kind of fun because he runs around shooting zombies inside the, uh, inside the printer because that's what you do in Doom. And, of course, will he kill all the zombies any more than we can kill all the zombies in our network? No. But there's even more. So many, many networks have things attached to them that don't quite look like things. So that thing on the left there, that's a medical dispensing machine. It's used in hospitals to dispense medicines. It's open up. What does that look like internally? Looks awfully like a PC to me. That thing on the right is an ultrasound machine, standard ultrasound machine that people use for uh, diagnostics in, in, in uh, hospitals or for doing ultrasounds on babies. Um, I don't know if anybody who's been on this call has you know, had a child recently, but they'll email you a picture of your ultrasound. How do they do that? Well, that's an XP machine that's got an SMTP client on it, hooks up to a hospital network. Work. So is the device on the left. Now what's important about these medical devices is in order for them to get certified, they have to actually ha go through a rigorous process. And any major change to them, and upgrading the operating system is considered a major change, requires recertification. So by and large, they don't get patched. Yet every single one of these is vulnerable, and they're connected to the network. Uh, in the instance installations that we've had in medical facilities, these types of devices are the ones that we most routinely find, find infected. Uh, pretty much anywhere we go, we typically find infected printers, but in medical facilities, we find the drug dispensing devices and the, uh, the ultrasound machines and the MRI machines. Didn't put an MRI machine up here because it's too big. Um, are infected and, you know, pulling apart the control of an MRI machine. Nobody's done a picture of it that I could find anyway. Now, why is that important? Well, think about it. Let's say you had an orderly that was working in, in a hospital that uh, you, know, you could pay a little bit of money to go up to these things and take what it dispenses for them. These things dispense things like OxyContin and other types of narcotics, highly valuable product. So they can do that. Or if you're trying to figure out if uh, a given politician has a particular health problem, well, you may not know exactly which hospital they're going to, but the patient ID record is in all these things that come off the ultrasounds. And you can gather all that data if you are a large nation state actor and sift through it to find what you need. And now you know the health problems or the vulnerabilities of the people that you're, you're going after. This is real. But wait, there's more. 
Uh, Johannes did a stormcast about this a couple weeks ago, where uh, he found the, that in fact there was a vulnerability, and I'll let Johannes describe the exact problem here, in drug dispensing pumps. These are the things that people use to pump drugs into their IV. Johannes, why don't you describe this this stormcast? And I'm, it's in the archive stormcast as well. Yeah, I just mentioned that uh, as uh, one of the uh, daily uh, podcasts that I'm doing as sort of one of the news items here. And the, the real thing with these uh, pumps was that it is actually not really hacking if you just have to log in. And in this case, there's a Telnet server running on uh, these uh, pumps. And they're usually used as part of, sort of your infusion system to sort of add medications uh, for the patient. And the Telnet server on uh, these pumps doesn't actually even require a login. So there is no username and password prompt. You're connected as root right away. They're running Linux. Now, the way this works is they're actually usually connected via a Wi-Fi network. Now, this Wi-Fi network is typically protected via WPA2 and such, so that's reasonably secure, but they also have a wired port in the back, and if you connect to this wired port, for example, you are a patient or a nurse or something like this that has physical access to one of these pumps, then you're automatically connected to the entire hospital network that connects all of them. You can also then, at this point, extract the secret that's being used, sort of your WPA secret. So uh, once you are connected physically to a pump, you have the entire pump network, at least, uh, or the hospital network, depending on how they have it segmented, under your control. And you know, if that weren't scary enough, uh, Johannes has an actual exploit that he discovered uh, and the guys at the Storm Center worked through, showing exactly how a fairly simple set of, again, devices that connect to your network that you wouldn't necessarily think about being something that someone would hack can be used not just to attack them, but as jumping off points for uh, other attacks. Uh, you got control, Jonas. Yeah. Okay, just taking over here. The transition takes a little bit of time here. But th that's kind of what I want to talk a little about here is the use of these devices as a bridgehead. And in part, you know, the problem you have with these devices, they're so ubiquitous in your network. It's really hard to track them and to account for all of these devices. It's it kind of now already you have it in your house, and it's even worse sort of in businesses. Uh, I'm just in the process of renovating a house and actually last week the contractor came to me and said, well, under the house there is a there's a box. They don't know what it does, but uh, if they connect power to it, it hums really loudly and shakes the floor, so they decided to disconnect it. I bet, you know, in 20, 30 years or so, if someone is taking over that house and renovating again, they'll find all kinds of little boxes that I've probably installed that do more than hum and shake the house when you connect it uh, to a power. Uh, what we had here is, now I mentioned at the beginning a little bit about the shield and uh, in the storm center and Tom was elaborating a little bit on this. What we, for example, spotted here a while ago uh, with our sensor networks, with our firewall logs, was that there were a lot of scans for port 5000. And we initially didn't really know what this was about. Now, port 5000 is used uh, by uh, bunch of different devices as an HTTP sort of uh, access point. So uh, essentially you will get a web server on port 5000. Port 5000 is typically not associated with a web server, but what we find is a lot of these devices have services running on odd ports. So Telnet may not just be running on port 23, it could be running on another port as well. And in this case, port 5000 for a web server. In particular, Synology disk stations are uh, affected by this. Now, the next thing we usually do is when we see a report uh, that basically indicates that we do have uh, traffic like this, we try to notify owners. And part of it, the way we do this is uh, we post about it, so then uh, people who want to help us out, they sniff on a network. Because what we really are looking for is 
who is emanating this traffic, who is sending this port 5000 traffic and where it's coming from. And the one set of devices where we saw this traffic coming from were DVRs. Now these are not your TiVo DVRs. These are DVRs that are commonly used for security cameras. You may have seen them like at your local Costco or such. Uh, where they sell security systems that have a number of cameras. They all record their footage to this DVR. This DVR is a Linux box, very minimal hardware in there. The, the biggest part of it is really the the hard drive, it records all of it to the motherboard itself is, well, maybe half the size of your iPhone. It's uh, really, really small. Now, what we found out here is that these devices were compromised in large numbers, well, again, just by logging in. It didn't actually require much of an exploit. All it required, logging in as root with a password of one, two, three, four. And once we got to take a look at a couple of these devices, I also bought myself one off eBay and connected it here to my little Internet of Things kind of lab where sort of exposed random devices to the Internet. Then we found that there are a number of tools that got installed after an attacker compromised the device. Now, first of all, these devices run an extremely stripped down version of Linux. Now, there is no WGET, there is no FTP client or anything like this that would make it easy for the attacker to sort of install additional software. And I'll talk in a second about how they actually went about installing uh, this uh, software. But what we found was, first of all, a Bitcoin miner. Now, I mentioned these devices have very minimal CPUs. Uh, those Bitcoin miners were not very efficient. We did find the scanner for the Synology vulnerability. And then we did find a number of helper tools that the attackers installed on these devices. Now, you may ask yourself, why is Telnet turned on and why is the password 12345? Well, first of all, there is no configuration, at least in the firmware version back at the time, that would allow you to turn off Telnet. In addition, this is the dialog, if you find it, that allows you to change the password. So, Yes, if you find that little yellow button here on the very right, you can change it to a full keyboard, but the only input device you have is a mouse. So you have to point on the screen here to actually set a different key, a different password, and it's not easy to set a strong password. After talking to the manufacturer about these problems, about these compromises, they actually released a newer version of the firmware. Now Telnet at least is turned off by default, and when you set it up the first time, it will ask you to configure a password. The old firmware had not even a note in the manual that suggests you change the password. And the reason these devices are exposed to the internet is that uh, in particular small businesses often have outside security companies that monitor these devices. So as a result, if anything is connected on, uh, is, is exposed uh, to the public internet, then it is probably this very vulnerable device. And again, a device that's hard to secure. Now, when we posted about this, we actually had someone respond via Twitter who claimed that they were behind at least some of these compromises. And to prove it, they actually gave us here this paste bin address that contains the little Python script they used to copy over uh, the t these binaries uh, to the device. And they also did give us access to screenshots from their admin interface that would tell us how many of uh, these devices that got compromised here, this group apparently had sort of at its peak about uh, 3,000 devices compromised, and then how many Bitcoin, how much Bitcoin they made. Actually, it was Litecoin, another cryptocurrency they mined here, and this is sort of their income. I sort of tried to add it up, and uh, I ended up with about $3 worth at the time uh, of actual money they sort of made with this. So this is certainly, you know, not necessarily the best way to take advantage of these devices, which is why they went further, why they scanned for Synology devices. 
Now, here's just a little snippet of the code they used to actually copy these binaries over. So this is what their Python script did. It essentially just used Telnet and then used this echo command to write to the uh, to the file system and then it sort of used this little marker here. So whenever this marker came back, the Python script knew that the last uh, set of bytes was received and then it would send the next set of bytes and this is sort of how one line at a time they would essentially echo over uh, this uh, binary. Now. Let's go back to these knowledge to devices. So this is kind of what they were really after. They have a web-based admin interface running on port 5000. There are numerous vulnerabilities, and I don't really want to hit too hard on Synology here. There are a number of similar devices out there by different manufacturers. Trobo is one of them, QNAP, and there are probably a dozen of these devices uh, or makers of these devices that all follow the same principle. You take a basic server essentially with respect to the hardware configuration, you add a bunch of hard drives to it and then you load Linux and all kinds of vulnerable web apps out there. I was working with a lawyer here in town a while ago and he used one of these devices and of all software pieces you could find, well, that was pre-installed, he used WordPress to share confidential documents with me. So plenty of vulnerabilities in these devices, often they're not necessarily reported as being specific to the device, but if you have something like a WordPress vulnerability, well it's just reported as a WordPress vulnerability, not necessarily as a vulnerability specific to Synology or QNAP or whatever. So here's a list of vulnerabilities that is actually specific to Synology and this Webman vulnerability, well uh, that's the one we found being exploited here in this particular case. So where does it all end up? Well, it turns out that uh, this particular vulnerability was also used to breach some of these Synology devices. Remember, this DVR is now your entry point into the larger network. Once I'm on your Synology device, then I have access to all of the data stored on the Synology device and you may be smart enough not to expose it to the public internet unlike my lawyer friend. So you have that Synology device nicely tucked behind, away behind your firewall but once I'm compromising your DVR then I can scan you from the inside and now I can hit your Synology device and exploit it and steal whatever data is on there and of course for good measure because that's what hackers do these days I'll also install a Bitcoin miner on your Synology device which probably gives me a little bit more uh, money for per time than this little uh, Linux system on the DVR. Now one thing actually you have seen lately in particular with these Synology devices is that yes, like in this case with Iowa State, someone can break into the device, steal your data and sell it on the black market. So in this case they got 30,000 social security numbers. Problem for an attacker is social security numbers, while it's bad to have them lost, they're not really all that valuable anymore these days. All social security numbers are essentially public. Same for credit card numbers. There are way more credit card numbers that have been leaked over the last couple of years than attackers could ever exploit, which is actually the result while a lot of credit card companies no longer bother to necessarily replace your credit card, they wait for actual fraud to happen before they go through the pain and spend the money to send you a new credit card. So really very little value here. My guess is they may have gotten a thousand bucks or so for these social security numbers, not necessarily bad, but that's I think sort of the upper limit you would sort of get for 30,000 social security numbers and of course a lot of these devices don't have credit cards on them, they don't have social security numbers on them, well they may have backups on there. Now one thing we have seen lately happening with desktop PCs is that the attackers really found a new way to monetize compromised systems. In the old days 
They would steal your banking password, they would steal your personal information, and they would try to sell it on the black market, or they would try to use it themselves. Typically, the value of a PC here is sort of a, a dollar or maybe ten dollars a PC if you found a good one. Now, what they found lately is that this data you have on your PC, all of those family pictures and things like this, are actually more worth to you than anybody they could sell it to on the black market. So what happened lately is that they start encrypting your data and sell it back to you. The old way, you didn't even notice that your data was stolen. That was sort of one of the neat things about stealing data, that the original owner still had it. Now they actually steal it from the original owner by encrypting it. Think crypto locker and the like, and then they sell that data back to you by giving you the key. Well, what we have seen now with these storage devices is that the same thing happens with your online storage devices. They are now being encrypted and then that data is being sold back to you and usually at a pretty hefty price. Like this sooner locker I believe did ask for something like $500 in Bitcoin in order to get your money back. And then also remember last time you know, your relative or whatever got infected with uh, crypto locker, the advice you gave them, hey, make backups, but now your backups are encrypted as well and you're just at the same spot where you were before all of this happened. And this is really a trend we have seen lately where the bad guys sort of take advantage of encryption to deprive you of your data and with that they're being able to make more money of it. So really a couple issues here. First of all, that we do have these devices that are really considered to be less important, not all that sensitive being used as a beachhead in your network because these devices are exposed. And then secondly, where data on these devices is now being encrypted instead of plain stolen. And with that, I want to hand it back over to Tom. Thanks, Johannes. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be uh, scaring people too much, but I think it's pretty important that people understand uh, what the um, what's going on. the 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 situation, really, from a network and and security standpoint, at a fundamental level, hasn't really changed. What's changed is that the devices that are being gone after are no longer things where you have direct hands on and control. So we sort of back to where we were before people really started getting serious about securing their servers and their laptops and their desktops because there are all these other things in the network that IT didn't even really think about being IT. You know, when we had PC LANs and networks and the internet, it was kind of a guerrilla thing. The big guys with the mainframes, they're like, oh, these silly PCs, this internet thing is a toy, it's a fad like CB radio, they ignore it. And then, of course, it became mission critical. It wasn't designed to be mission critical, and so they came in and they bolted a whole bunch of security and stuff on it. Great. But now we're back to where it's square one, because all of these devices are brought in. They're added to ad services on an ad hoc manner. In many cases, they're brought in, and they're not under control of IT at all, because they are a medical system. They are a drug dispensary system. They are the... DVR is being used by physical plant security. They are the HVAC control system, which, by the way, is how the hackers actually originally got into uh, to Target. Um, and all of these things connect to the network. So once again, you don't control the endpoints. And you aren't responsible for their configuration management, so in many cases, you can't patch them. So what do you got to do? Well, first off, you have to go back to basics. Realize that a great deal of this stuff is installed by the same guy who has a problem uh, a problem keeping their pants up. In fact, it was really funny. I wish I'd known about this, the details, when we were uh, presenting this Lunch and Learn at SANS in San Diego because there's a construction project right next door. And the guy operating the backhoe broke the water main. So there was no water in the hotel for toilets or anything uh, washing that we were at for SANS San Diego. And why? Backhoe failure. It's something that uh, we frequently refer to by the thing that these people who can't keep their pants up tend to show, uh, which is that you've got people for whom 
let's face it, paying attention to their, their personal dress and hygiene is not necessarily important doing these types of installations. So they're not going to pay any attention to network security even if they knew one existed. And their vendors of these equipment are not interested in network security. They're there to deliver functionality at a low price. So what you have to do is you have to secure it. The first thing is discover and inventory what's on the network. And there's something very, very important here. One of the things in the national cybersecurity framework that's being talked about is know what you have, know your data, and know what you care about. At the risk of, uh, of, of upsetting the, uh, the national command infrastructure, I believe that they've got that exactly backwards, and I've actually told it to them. Um, because as Johannes pointed out right now, just recently, it's not what you care about that matters, because they'll get to that. It's what they care about. And what they care about may not be the things that you care about. I mean, you probably didn't, don't care really that much about the security DVR. You figure that if it stops working, they'll buy a new one. It's not expensive. It's the guy who's sitting with the belt and the, uh, and the pistol at the door has to look at it. And as far as you know, it has nothing to do with your network, except it does because it connects to it and it attacks it. It's not something that you would, and the data is fairly ephemeral. So it's not, again, it's not the sort of stuff that you're going to go through on your PCI DSS checklist and go, oh, I've got to check that the DVR and the data secured in the DVR is, in fact, configuration managed and because you're looking at video streams, right? Except that it's an attack vector. So you have to be concerned with what's important to the attacker, not what's important to you, although you've got to be concerned about that, too. But your primary thing is what can be used against you. What is important to them? You have to think like your enemy without becoming it. And then so you don't have that problem with, uh, with showing things that you shouldn't be. You need a belt and suspenders. You need to have multiple different ways of securing it. Make sure that not only do you have your network security down and your configuration management and your audit. Oh, by the way. You've got to do it all the time because these things plug and unplug. Your marketing team may suddenly have a Synology plugged into the network because they're taking a bunch of stuff out to the net to uh, to interrupt Tokyo. They need it for the trade show, and so they went and bought it at Fry's so that they can back their stuff up so they have the video and the PowerPoints on the booth in case the internet goes down. Trust people, but constantly verify it. And the reality is, since you don't control and you can't control, people will will break. You, you become Mordak, the preventer of information services, and they'll just ignore you. People are going to do what they need to do, and they're going to get the devices that they that they have to get. And whether you have visibility all the way up to the CIO or the CEO, the fact is, the line people are driven to do their jobs, and they have insufficient personnel, insufficient time. And they will grab the things that will help make their job easier because they're told about it by their buddy at the water cooler or they're told about it at the conference they went to on HVAC. So the only way you have control of this is doing it at the network level. You've got to look at your packet streams. You've got to audit the, the, the flows. You've got to validate what things are coming in, what things are going out. Make sure that you know what the connections are. A lot of that traffic may be encrypted, by the way. It may be SSL. Um, one of the things that the attackers have figured out is that deep packet inspection doesn't work very well if you're doing SSL, particularly if you do out of order packets or, I don't know, as was shown at RSA, you put it in a JPEG and you flip one bit out of a, out of a big JPEG. You have plenty of information. Or they can send it as encrypted DNS query packets. That's the good news. They have the same weak point that a criminal or a spy in the real world has. They have to get the data back to them. And that means that it has to go to something that they trust and control. And that destination cannot be encrypted. Everything on the internet comes together at the source and destination IP address and or the DNS query that allows you to get to that resource. And while DNS names can be randomized, the infrastructure to support them, the name servers, has to be fairly stable. The glue records have to be stable because they have to be registered with the actual TLD servers. And unless you happen to be a you know, national registrar that can make changes every 10 seconds, and even then, 
the TLD servers won't accept those registrations that quickly. Your Flux botnet can't have Fluxers as the glue name. Those three name servers have to be fairly stable, and if you block those, you'll never get into the Flux botnet. So we do have a, a we do have a lever that we, the defenders, can use. As long as we're paying attention at the network level, we do have something that we can use to protect ourselves, which is focusing on the infrastructure that's used by the criminals and nation state actors. They can move it around a bit, but it's still a bounded problem, even in V6. V6 is 128 bits. Well, you know, with 64-bit CPUs running at 4 gigahertz and ASICs designed to sift that, that is a big problem. But it's not an NP complete problem by doing like doing deep packet inspection, looking at content, and trying to crack open crypto. So here we are today, right? They've got unbelievable resources that cost them nothing. Everything we do costs us money. We're all busily defending ourselves. They're using the internet to attack us. What do we do? Well, as I said. Johannes and the guys at the Storm Center are sort of the archetype of this, but there are a lot of good people out there now gathering information. There's guys like Roman Husey at abuse.ch, there's the Shadow Server Foundation, there are a bunch of groups that tend to stay relatively under the radar where people collaborate and all of us are involved in these, sharing information and figuring out who, uh, who the, the attackers are and what infrastructure they have. Um, there are the, the ISAC groups, and if you are in any of the critical infrastructure groups, you really should be active in ISAC. If you are in the U.S. Uh, and you are part of any of the national credit infrastructure, you really need to be active in, in InfraGuard. These are places where people can get together and share information, and that information is useful. Now we're no longer acting like a medieval castle where we're building up our defenses individually while the barbarians run around and attack villages and grab the resources, the, the grain that we need to feed themselves. By collaborating together, we're able to identify who they are and where they're coming from and where they're going. And then we can put that into our network infrastructure and tilt the balance. That filters out the worst traffic and allows the good traffic to go through. But the key here is collaboration and working together. Just as in the real world, we stopped with the everybody's got their own castle and their own private army back in the 18th century and we introduced the concept of sharing information about who's doing the bad things, finding the people and the shop houses and the fences that they use and putting them in jail, i.e. taking them out of society. So we can do the same thing on the internet. It's a little bit harder because there's not exact mapping of sorry, there's not an exact mapping of infrastructure um, to people in, st in stable time, but there is for a period of time. And that period of time is not exactly super short. And usually, although it can't necessarily be identified when they change immediately, if you're collaborating, then let's say one guy has decided that he doesn't want to talk to China, or he's got uh, a WebSense URL filter on his firewall. And his firewall blocks some new attack. Once that information is shared using DShield or some other method, then everybody else who participates in that community is able to defend themselves together. And that's what ThreatStop does. So ThreatStop leverages this idea of sharing information. We gather data from all over the place. I mentioned some of the sources, we, parts of others. We were involved in Farsight Security Information Exchange, which was founded out of the Internet Sto uh, Systems Consortium. Uh, we started off with DShield. We still host a mirror for, for DShield, and we continue to share information. We make that available as a policy, set of policy elements, and it includes geo-blocking. There are plenty of reasons to do geo-blocking. It, it is a good thing to do, particularly if you're in the financial services industry or defense. Um, you want to be not talking to IPs in a given country. But that helps you create a policy that matches your needs. Your firewalls and your DNS servers download the current set of policy that you've decided, the IP addresses and networks, name servers that match what you decided you want to block. And by the way, whitelist. You've got whitelisting capability as well. And it's in your firewall. It's done periodically, timer set to two hours by default, but you can set it to whatever you want. It's done via DNS query. Now, when you've got that infected device inside your network that's going to call home to its master, and by the way, they have to do that to generate the crypto keys to encrypt your hard drive, it's blocked, and it's logged in your firewall. 
At the same time, all the in inbound scanners that are looking for vulnerabilities are being blocked because that's shared information across the whole infrastructure. So you're invisible to the things that are looking for vulnerabilities, which frequently are not the same ones that are going to inject the exploit. So you never even get hit with the exploit, even though you might be vulnerable. The firewall will load the log data back up to our cloud service, where we cross-correlate the information, which gives you a report that shows what inside your network, and remember this is on the firewall, so it's pre-NAT, is infected, so you can go clean it up. Uh, I'm not your regula regulator, regulator, regulator or your compliance officer, but in most cases, the fact that it was blocked as opposed to allowed does mean that it's not necessarily a reportable item. Um, and all that data that you sent back up to the cloud is now fed back into the system and used to help protect you and everybody else by cross-correlation. And that's how the threats get stopped. So, you got things in your network. Many of them can't be patched. A lot of them aren't anyway, even if they could be, because people don't think about them. As with everything else, they're pwned. The only way to really stop that from hurting you is to block the command and control channels that are used by the malware to do bad things to you. And when you block that, you block that connection, you can identify it and remediate. And by sharing information, we work together. Thank you. We're ready for questions now. Thank you very much, Tom and Johannes. Um, to start, we, I'd like to open the floor to the Q&A section, and we have a couple of questions here. The first one, our compliance team requires us to restrict communications with potential terrorist countries. Can your solution help? Yes. Uh, in fact, it's one of the uh, default aggregate groups that we keep track of for people. Um, we have, uh, for all of our customers, um, not just ones in expert mode, the uh, ITAR and the OFAC block list. So we block the IP addresses of, you can choose to block any trafficking in arms regulation restriction country, um, or if you're a financial institution, OFAC, and it, uh, it just becomes part of your policy. Thank you. And our next question, how do you handle false, false positives and avoid blocking legitimate traffic? Well, part of the secret is to update the, the list very quickly. Um, we do cr a lot of cross-correlation of data. We have an extensive whitelisting, um, and it's dynamic whitelisting, so it's based on uh, popular sites that are clearly not criminal. Um, we partner with the major hosting and, uh, and content delivery network vendors to make sure we have their IP addresses available to whitelist. Um, and again, it's a feedback loop, right? So if suddenly we see an outlier spike, it immediately gets escalated to security for two reasons. One, it could be a new attack, uh, or two, it could be a false positive. Um, that doesn't mean we haven't had a few. Everybody has false positives. It's the unfortunate problem. Um, thankfully, there have been nothing as disastrous as uh, Norton Antivirus seeing the Chinese NT.dll as, uh, as a virus and deleting every Chinese Windows edition that it was on. So we avoid them by rapid feedback loops and lots and lots of, uh, of, of whitelisting. Nice, thank you. For our next question, what about plane hacking that is in the news recently? You want to take that, Johannes? Yeah, sure, I can, I can talk about this a little bit. Uh, and that's also one of those in and of devices or in and of things uh, kind of issue that uh, your plane is a thing or actually better a network of things uh, that is uh, not properly segregated from the passenger network apparently. Uh, the other issue you're running into with uh, plane networks is how do you do your logging? Uh, you probably want to do your logging off-site, which means off the plane. So now you need a data connection just uh, for logging and keeping those logs off the plane, which isn't easy to do given all the bandwidth limitations you have on a plane. Like if you've ever used Wi-Fi on a plane, it works reasonably well sort of across the U.S., uh, but uh, once you sort of cross the Pacific or so, then you're down to satellite links, which usually don't really have uh, that ample bandwidth in particular, considering sort of all the planes that are sort of in the air there at the same time. Well, I mean, let's face it, right? One of the reasons they can't fly to that Malaysia Airlines plane is the, the bandwidth over the ocean is so limited that even doing position tracking, which is an operational concern, concern is something that the airlines are, are loath to do. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the network uh, 
the, the entertainment network and the operational network are not segmented because having two separate satellite uplinks on the plane would be extremely expensive. Yeah, there was actually about the cost of an interesting story lately, you know, with Google Wi-Fi and so on offering more and more. Uh, they've sort of managed to keep the costs down in part by using cell phone systems across the U.S. And that's, of course, no fine as long as you stay over land. Uh, but even then, you know, it's a couple thousand dollars or so per plane just for the equipment. The satellite links that actually sort of add a little hump to the plane, uh, the old systems actually had sort of a mechanically adjustable satellite dish inside there. Uh, which is very expensive and more importantly, uh, very heavy. Uh, I think it corresponded to three seats in the airplane, the weight of satellite equipment. You know, that's real money if you consider that that's a few thousand dollars you lose on every single flight. And for our next question, how do you scale the secure install lot? How do you scale the secure install? Uh, well, so so it's DNS, so that makes it fairly easy to scale. Um, what you do is the way the way you configure your policy. You configure your policy, and so we have customers that have hundreds of firewalls that share the same policy. Um, once you configure your policy, that's turned into a custom DNS lookup for you, and we have simple scripts that use the native configuration of the firewall, or you could do it manually if you want, uh, that then set that DNS lookup as the target of your policy. So that's exactly why I came up with the idea of doing it via DNS, because otherwise I'm writing multiple different policies for multiple different firewalls using multiple different interfaces. It's driving me up a wall. Uh, there are tools that you can buy. They're very expensive that will do firewall rule management, um, and obviously they have more granularity than allow and deny. But the real problem is not doing complex firewall rule management. The real problem is, what do I want to block today? And can I change that quickly? And that's exactly why we did it using DNS. Um, so it scales extremely well. DNS is the only global scale, globally scalable system of information about endpoints. We're simply using it in a novel way, which is why we're able to get a patent on it. Um, in that, it so you could have a million firewalls if you wanted to, and we have a global anycasted v4 and v6 network um, that could query your policy. Um, they're ACL down to your devices only, so only your devices can read your zone, which is where your policies are. But your policies are a lookup in a zone that belongs to you. In we do it private, so it's threatstop.local, uh, and it's DNS, so it scales at internet scale. If the DNS doesn't scale, we've got a bigger problem than whether your policies don't work. Thank you. And for our final question, can you provide more detail on how you get your data, global sources? Uh, we have a number of public sources that I mentioned. Obviously, we also have private sources, some of which are specific to certain industry groups and so uh, are not available to everybody. Um, we have over 40 current data sources, plus we have the feedback loop of all the firewall logs that come back from our users, cross-correlation of that. We have the information that we are uh, privy to as part of being on the Security Information Exchange, where we're peered with most of the world's uh, major sources of threat data. Um, we have passive DNS data that we cross-correlate uh, to find new domain names, etc. Um, there's a wide variety of sources. Depending on uh, on the, the asker, we can just share more details under non-disclosure, um, and several of our sources are called out specifically in just the UI. The ones that are publicly no available uh, are called out by name in the user inf user inter interface at ThreatStop. Thank you. And that brings us to the top of the hour. With that, thank you so much, Tom and Johannes, for your great presentation and for bringing this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. And until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for our next SANS webcast. Thank you.